and then 1.25, and then 1.5, and then 2x, and then 3x. So I listen with Speechify 800 words per minute today. Wow. Most people's reading speed is between 180 and 200 words per minute. So I listen four times faster than most people read. Welcome, this is Phil Michaels, Forbes 30 Under 30 Entrepreneur and Performance Coach. Forbes names the top 30 entrepreneurs, leaders, and stars in the world. And each week, we bring you one of them to help you level up in your life and business. From celebrities like LeBron James to Kylie Jenner and Cardi B, you're sure to learn from the list. Thanks for spending time with me today. Now it's time to level up. Level up. Level up. Welcome to Phil with Forbes 30 Podcast. Today, we have a very special guest. He's the founder of the Speechify text-to-speech software, the 10th highest grossing productivity app on Apple's App Store, third app in Apple's newspapers category used to read more than a billion words every month. At 22, he was one of the youngest people named a Forbes 30 under 30 list. He's a dyslexia advocate, listens to 100 books per year, ladies and gentlemen, and has the first chapter of Harry Potter memorized. Please welcome Cliff Weitzman. Very hey, excited to have you here, Cliff. Welcome. Very happy to be here. And little did I know, today is Cliff's birthday. So happy birthday, Cliff. Thank you so much, man. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have a very special day for Cliff. So let's make it special for him by starting off with how I met him. Cliff and I met in Israel, one of the Forbes events a couple of years back, and we immediately connected, resonated with each other's energy, and he became known as Backflip Cliff because he is exceptional at performing backflips. So in Israel, as we we're traveling around, every time we would meet a new group of people, I would call it out, hey, Cliff, show him the backflip. <laughs> cameras were out, and he became an instant celebrity, which very much helped us connect with a lot of people we didn't meet before. So thank you for that. Yeah. So it's a very crazy time right now with COVID-19 and you're in California. I'm curious to know your go-to hack to get the most out of the COVID time. What's something you and your team are doing right now to play offense rather than defense during these crazy times? Yeah, so we're actually a remote team. We're 25 engineers. And so we have a team in Ukraine, a team in London, a team in Paris. Uh, some of the East Coast, some of the West Coast. And we have been remote for the past two years. And COVID has actually been amazing for us because our productivity is not impacted at all. Um, but it makes it really easy for us to hire. Number one, because a lot of people are in a transitional period. Number two, because people who still have their jobs at previous places that they've been find it more easy to do work trials. So the way that we hire is we believe that off of an interview, you can never tell how good somebody is. You can all, only figure it out by actually working with them. And so we have four criteria we look for in people that we hire. We look for people who learn super fast, who take a lot of initiative, who have fire in the belly for the product, and high loyalty and integrity to the team. And if I find such a person, and they reach out to us and ask, hey, can I work with Speechify, et cetera, I'll give them a test task. And if they do really well on that, I'll give them a second one, and a third, and a fourth. Uh, if they're working on a full-time job, it's a little difficult to fully invest in doing those tasks. But if you're there working from home, it's not very hard at all because they have much more control mm. over the time. So we've hired four people already during this time period. That's a true example of someone playing offense, not defense. Sounds like you're very opportunistic. And when I think of Cliff, that's what I think of as someone as efficient, effective, and always ready to be opportunistic and optimistic about yeah. the current times. Um, we actually use a similar method with my ed tech company where we uh, like to see how someone works in person or a distributed way, but give them a task, a project, and see how well they do with it. How well do they perform? Because anyone nowadays can sell themselves in an interview or on a resume. I love that approach. So Cliff, take us back to the very beginning. Where are you from, wh where you grew up, and the path that led you to where you are now, making it to the Forbes list? Sure. Um, so I was born in Israel. I grew up there and I am super dyslexic, right? So first, second, third, fourth grade, could not figure out how to read no matter how hard I tried. Um, but I was a very confident kid, very precocious. I performed on like national TV, uh, doing singing. Um, I did like all the school plays and stuff like that, but I was also a very small kid. So I didn't excel in sports or anything like that. 
And when I couldn't read, it was pretty devastating because my family really values education and I just couldn't deliver on that no matter mm. how hard I tried. And so every day I would sit in the public library and I would try to learn how to read or at least try to practice reading. And I would fall asleep in the book because my speed was so slow that it was very boring and my brain moved kind of fast. So eventually my dad took pity on me and he sat with me in my bed and in a slow, deep voice, he read books to me. My favorite one was Harry Potter. Uh, so much so that he recorded himself reading Harry Potter and I'd walk around the house listening to him <laughs> reading Harry Potter. And this was originally in Hebrew. And Wow. So you, he was reading it to you in Hebrew and you're assimilating all this knowledge in real time as he's reading it. Exactly. And then later too, I just kept listening to the recordings. And then we moved to London and then we moved to the US and we moved um, about the time I turned 13. And we found an audiobook of Harry Potter in English right before we moved. And my dad asked me, hey, Cliff, if I buy this for you, will you listen to it? And mm -hmm. I was like, yes. He's like, are you sure? I'm like, yes. I'm like, mind you, I do not speak English at this point. Like there's a video where like, he's like, Cliff, what is black? What is white? <laughs> um, so I started to listen, maybe understanding like one out of like 15 words, 10 words. And I listened to that thing 22 times in a row. And that's how I learned English. And I had a wow. British accent when I first got here. And I've been in love with audiobooks ever since. Uh, I listen to about 100 books a year. I've done that for, um, for a very long time now. And when I started high school, um, I was a little bored in high school because most of the people around me were not as engaged or interested or interesting. Um, and I started building projects and it, school was still difficult for me because I still was kind of like a slow reader, but I still performed well because I was the type of kid who, if I had a class that I was struggling with, I was the first kid there way before the first bell rang and the last kid there. And I would just pepper the teacher with questions. I remember <laughs> the AP tests that I took that were for classes I did not take but I convinced the teacher from those classes to sit with me for like three, four, five lunches. And I would just like pepper them with question and like download the knowledge of like US AP mm -hmm. history uh, from their brain into mine. And when I got to college, turns out I had to do like 200 pages of reading per week. I did my own independent concentration in renewable energy engineering at Brown, but I also took classes in philosophy, political science, et cetera. And most of those things did not have an audio book. So what I ended up doing is building my own text-to-speech software that let me highlight the text, click a keyboard shortcut, and it started to read. And I could change the speed, change the voices, set it to my phone. I built a little app that let me scan physical books with my, with my iPhone, um, and it would immediately start reading. And this was a godsend. I would longboard to class and listen. I would sit and breakfast and listen. And so I actually ended up not needing to do homework in college. Any of the reading just happened passively in the because background. you were using the technique that your dad used for you with Harry Potter this seemed to resonate with you and you were able to assimilate knowledge much faster and more efficient and effectively okay. so you found a way to build that same way your dad helped you but for your own purpose while you're in college while you're in high school exactly and what happened to me which is wonderful is when I started to listen I didn't speak English and so I couldn't speak I couldn't listen at 1x speed I listened at mm. 0.75, 0.6 X speed. And my brain got really good at filling in the blanks because if the sentence say, said, Harry lifted his wand, maybe I knew what the word Harry said and I knew what the word wand meant, but I didn't know what lifted meant. Um, and so I would have to fill in the gaps. And I was like, well, lifted probably means used, raised in there, something mm. like that. And if you hear that sentence a couple of times, you figure out what the word means. And so my brain got really good at filling in the gaps. And, and comprehension, it, you're filling in the gaps, you're, you're able to read the underlying message. Excellent. Exactly. So even today, like, it's so easy for me to finish up people's sentences because I just had so much reps doing this. Mm -hmm. And then what happened is I started to be able to listen at 1x speed, and then 1.25, and then 1.5, and then 2x, and then 3x. So I listen with speech of 800 words per minute today. Wow. Most people's reading speed is between 180 and 200 words per minute. So I listen four times faster than most people read. And it's just because I got the opportunity to practice listening fast because we spent 10 years in elementary school learning how to read. And no one expects a kid when they're 10 years old to have a fast reading speed or a good comprehension. You sure. know that they need some time schooling to do that. I got to have that learning in a much shorter period of time before my ears. Most and the current 
and the current school system, at least in the US, isn't set up for people that have dyslexia. It's not, it doesn't necessarily reward people that can't read at the effective rate they need to be reading or writing at the effective rate they need to be writing. So you found a way to kind of hack the system where you could still accomplish your academic tasks, but do it in a way that worked for you. Absolutely. Most people with dyslexia fall through the cracks, right? It's this very weird dichotomy where like you are nine years old, you objectively suck at the one thing you're supposed to be good at. So my teachers thought I was stupid. My parents thought I was lazy. They canceled my ninth birthday mm. party because they were very frustrated at me. Um, you start and, to, to get a label that you are less or inferior yeah, to those absolutely. that are excelling in the traditional school system. You have a big chip in your shoulder. And so two outcomes happen from this. Number one, you check out. You start not paying attention in class. You gain your credibility by being funny mm. um, and by not caring about what the teacher says. You might get into some, some, some trouble. 50% of um, incarcerated people in California and throughout the United States have dyslexia. At the same time, 40% of billionaires have dyslexia. And so it's this thing where either you fall through the cracks, which is the majority of people, now 5% of the people in public school are diagnosed with dyslexia, 70% of the population has it, but most don't know because it's expensive to get evaluated. But if you do figure out how to deal with it, it builds such ridiculous grit in those people that that applies for every part of your life. So for me, I just found a way around it with audiobooks and then text to speech and I built 36 products when I was in college. Everything from 3D printed skateboard breaks, biotech supplements, payments companies, apps, websites, um, to pay for school, I ended up hiring 10 freelancers in the Philippines to find a lot of scholarships for me and that paid for school. And then I built an API that let other people use the same thing. So when I graduated, I could travel, I could do what I wanted. And I asked myself if I was a billionaire right now, what would I want to do with my life, with my time? And the conclusion was, conclusion was I wanted to solve dyslexia. And so around the same time, I read a paper about the application of deep learning to text-to-speech, where for the first time you can do text-to-speech at near human equality using AI. I cried when I read this paper. I implemented it into my software. And a lot of things ensued, but uh, it ended up becoming the most popular text-to-speech tool in the world. It's used by millions of people, especially people like me who have dyslexia and ADD and low vision and concussions. But now it serves um, the majority of our users are professionals, doctors, lawyers, um, hedge fund managers, et cetera, on a daily basis. And I got to build an incredible team around me. And, and that's the quick short story of, of Speechify um, I also, as you know, I do a lot of music, I do a lot of fitness, I have a lot of different hobbies, uh, but that's what I spend most of my time on. Thanks for sharing, Cliff. And I'm sure you in the audience is wondering, well, I have dyslexia, this is exactly what I need. And you went from 0.5x to 0.75x, you started increasing the speed at which you would listen to these audio recordings of these books. For you in the audience, you might be wondering, how can I get started? So Cliff, what advice would you give someone that's just starting out, they have dyslexia and they wanna take a similar path? Cause I'm sure now that you're at 800 words per minute, but you didn't start there. So where should someone start? Yeah, so if you download Speechify, just search Speechify, Speech IFY uh, in the App Store or on Google. If you go to our website, you can download the Mac app. If you go to the App Store, you can download the iPhone app, which is superior. Um, and the first thing it'll do is let you pick a voice that is your favorite voice. So there's a voice called Stephanie, which is a British voice. It's based on my mom. And then <laughs> I love that. You can pick your speed. So it lets you play, find the speed that's comfortable for you. And if you really want to increase your speed, you can go to settings and turn on automatic speed ramping. So in the same way that if you put a frog in a pot and you start to boil it, it doesn't notice that it gets hot. Automatic speed ramping as you're listening every 3,000 words and increases you by one word per minute, two words, three words. Wow. So it automatically levels you up without you even noticing the difference. So it's kind of forcing you to get better and better over time. Exactly. And so the key is you want to listen at a speed that is not too fast that you really can't comprehend and is not too slow where you get bored. And it doesn't even match exactly your processing ability. You want to listen 10% higher than your processing ability. And you want that always to be the case. And here's what we also find out. Most kids, especially kids with dyslexia, have brains that work pretty fast. And they check out in class because they get bored. And so the worst thing you can do to someone is have them sit and intake information at half their processing speed. That's why if I made you sit and watch a movie at 50, 
percent speed, you'd get out of there immediately. <laughs> you need to think to match the speed at which their mind is working and that helps them. And that's how you engage someone. And that's actually comprehension goes up that way. And so most people do not start listening at 200 words per minute. They start listening at like 225, 250, because that's the speed of speaking. And then little by little, they increase from there. And so download Speechify in the App Store, find the closest piece of paper for you and take a picture of it, and it'll start to read. Or go to the news section and read the daily COVID updates. Um, or read something from the New York Times. Or if you have a big PDF that you need to read for school, for work, or whatever, upload it into the app. If you have a long email, go to the email, copy the email, open the app, it'll notice the copy uh, thing in your clipboard, and it'll just start to read. And just play around with it. So pick your favorite reading material or something you have to read maybe for school or for work and they can upload it and use your app and it will start reading and it'll start gradually and then work them up to a higher reading speed to eventually reach superhuman reading speed like cliff exactly <laughs> i love it so yeah. yeah this this is amazing i'm sure a lot of people will benefit from this and they sound like they already have so this is amazing and you you took something that was a challenge for you and you turned it into an advantage something that helps you get the best out of cliff um yes where exactly previously you might have been defined by a label that someone's given you and you were able to overcome that challenge that obstacle i love that and i also like how you mentioned you had to use humor to differentiate yourselves from the other classmates, for example. And maybe that's where the backflips came in and you're, you're just likable personality. Mm. The backflips are a different story. Um, I just like, when I set myself a goal, I just jump in with both, both feet. So when I was six, I saw a movie where Jackie Chan did a backflip and I was like, well, I must have do that. <laughs> and then I signed up for Capoeira and then gymnastics and we moved to the United States and gymnastics was expensive. So I learned from YouTube videos. And every time I saw anybody do a backflip, I would run over and be like, where did you learn how to do that? And one day I remember there was some dude who did a backflip like 10 houses down from like a house that I was at. And like I climbed two fences to get there. And I was like, how did you learn how to do that? <laughs> he's like, well, there's this rec center on like Sir Francis Drake Boulevard. So I went there and it was closed. I went there again and it was closed and it wasn't listed on Apple Maps. And I went to that place four times before I luckily went during a time that they were open in the weekend. It was three miles away from my house and I would bike there every day. And I made a deal with a guy who owned it that if I got to a certain level, I wouldn't need to pay to go there. And uh, it was the best thing ever. Um, and so that's how I practiced. And once I could do a backflip, I learned how to do fulls, front flips, a bunch of other things. And really everything in my life, like sometimes I'll just decide that I want to get good at something mm. and I'll just chase after that thing. Yeah, because you were able to do it at such a young age to identify what you want. And if it wasn't already available to you, you were going to create it. Exactly. Awesome. And I so, have a vision in my brain of like who Cliff is. And that vision is not mm. me right now. It's me like in five, ten years. And I assume that I have all the attributes and the skills that I desire. Right. So even when I was nine years old, I was like, obviously, I'll be able to read. Um, mm. And that's like the thing that carries you through. Because like, it's going to happen. I don't know if it's going to be with my eyes or with my ears or how I'm going to do it, but I'm going to make it happen. You visualized uh, it before it yeah, became you visualize true. visualized it all the time, yeah. Let's uh, dive into those pivotal people in your life. Jackie Chan inspired you to learn the backflip and the guy that you eventually met on Sir Fran Francis uh, Drake Boulevard. Who were the most pivotal people in your life to help you get to where you are now? Who was your coach, your mentor? Yeah, well, obviously my parents, right? So as I shared in the story before, um, like I love my dad more than anything in the world. And when I was young, like all I wanted to do was for him to be proud of me. And that was a big driver for me wanting to be good at reading. And he would even like give us little rewards. He'd always come up with little challenges. Like go, when I was like eight, go swim 200 laps. I'll pay you like half a shekel per, per lap, which... <laughs> go do it for like $5. But I was motivated. I went and did it. Um, he'd pay us for, for finishing books. And actually, uh, when we started learning English for finishing like ch children books in English as well, and I remember very vividly, my brother and my sister and I needed to read Yertle the Turtle. I got to read, man. <laughs> I memorized the book. On the faraway island of Solomon's soul, Yertle the Turtle was king of the pond. Nice little pond. It was clean. It was sweet. 
The water was warm, there was plenty to eat. The turtles had everything turtles might need. And they were all happy, quite happy indeed. Except for Yertle, the king of them all, who thought that the kingdom he ruled was too small. I am Yertle, he said, ruler of all that I see, but I don't see enough. That's the problem with me. And I have this entire book memorized. And I would <laughs> that was take awesome. This book. Um, but it was because I was so motivated. Um, and he challenged us to learn how to touch type, like everything. And my parents were really good at helping us figure out what we were passionate about from a young age. Not forcing it down our throats in any way, but just giving us the opportunities. Um, we would do like math competitions after dinner. My dad would be like, we'd have, I'm the oldest of five kids. So we'd sit around the table and my dad would be like, okay, 15 times three. And then like someone will blurt the answer, like cool. Uh, times 17 divided by 14 to the power of two. Like, and we just like, we'd go, like, we'd always play games like this. Your dad uh, sounds amazing. And he amazing. incentivized the right behaviors. Absolutely. And so the luckiest thing that I had growing up is number one, two parents that loved me unconditionally. Didn't mm. matter what the situation was. And I was naturally kind of like a very confident person to begin with, but that literally like had, I had a floor that I would never, was never going to go under. And then I had four younger siblings that I'm super like, are my best friends still to this day. Like we, we help each other all the time and they're all super high uh, achieving for the same reasons. Um, and we moved, moved around the world, but I basically had like a basketball team I was moving with um, of people. So it was great. Um, and then my mom as well. Like the way I found out I was dyslexic was I just, I couldn't figure it out. So mama bear went into research mode, read every book that you could possibly read. And in the like, I don't know, 30th, 40th book, she read about dyslexia and she was like, maybe this is it. And then she had me tested. Turns out that's, that's what I had. And like, that was the best day of my life because I finally mm -hmm. had like, like a hook, to, uh, a hook to put my hat on and be like, I'm not stupid. I'm not lazy. I just learned different. This That's is what it is. And this is what I want to do about it. Yeah, exactly. Um, and you turn your greatest pain into your greatest pleasure and advantage in the world. And now it's even become your business. Yeah. And now, so then the next set of mentors for me were books, right? So I read about quarter biographies, quarter fantasy, quarter like, science, psychology, sci-fi, business, self-improvement, and then the quarter of like philosophy and everything else. Um, and I like devour biographies, right? So Arnold Schwarzenegger, Alexander Hamilton, Benjamin Franklin, Theodore Roosevelt, like gigantic mm -hmm. list. And the thing that's amazing about books, especially if you're, re if you're reading a biography, but also if you're reading just a normal book, it's like you're sitting and having a conversation with the author. But for every minute in that book, they spent an hour trying to figure out what they were going to say and how to say it most effectively. So Alexander Hamilton's biography is 40 hours long. The man lived to age 50. So I basically read an hour representing every single one of the years in his life. So I know his life very well. Um, and that's a tremendous amount to learn from. And the same thing is true of many of the other great people in the world. And I don't limit it to just like Elon Musk or Steve Jobs. Literally, it's everybody who's incredible. Like, I want to learn what their life was like. Artists, musicians, uh, yes, whatever exactly. it may be. Exactly. And it shows you how to make difficult decisions and handle those situations. It shows you how to dream more than anything else. If you read The Wright Brothers, literally like half that book is about dreaming. Because there's no way that they're going to make it happen. Einstein. There's no way they're going to make it happen, but they just keep trying until it finally clicks. Um, and so I learned a lot from those. And then what's happened to me uh, more recently is I've just developed a magical ability, Phil, to access anybody that I want. I'm just really good at finding the right email, the right Facebook account, the right Instagram account, and writing messages that resonate with people that make them respond. And then we'll meet for coffee. So it doesn't matter if it's like the CEO of Cisco or... Um, like celebrities or musicians or you or the editor of Forbes, like I will slide in those DMs uh, <laughs> I will build new relationships. Uh, uh, that's actually what I was going to ask you next. Let's say someone isn't as fortunate as you. They don't have great parents or parents that know behavioral economics where they incentivize the right behavior. What would you share with someone? What advice would you give them on how can they find that right mentor or coach or someone that can guide them? Yeah, so uh, hundreds of people do that with me. So I have this philosophy, which is like, 
if in a little bit of time you can significantly help somebody else, do it. Because it improves my life, it improves their life, it doesn't take a lot of time for me. Um, and uh, actually for my birthday, like my DMs are like hundreds of messages from people who be like, hey, you impacted my life in this way and that way. Um, and so a lot of people will like read stuff I read, write on Medium or watch YouTube videos and make about this kind of stuff. And so, so for me, I, I'm always looking and assessing around me. And when I started college, I would go and I would eat three dinners every night. I'd grab a plate of food, sit with seven people I didn't know, get to know everybody. Grab another plate of food, sit with seven people I didn't know. Grab a cup of tea, sit with seven people I didn't know. I got to know, I don't know, 60, 70% of my grade in the first month or two. And I was able to pick and choose the best people. But not only people in my grade, people who were seniors. Um, and I would build relationships with them. And if they were great, I would just find excuses to spend as much time as possible with them. Yo, you want to go to the gym? Hey, mm. I'm organizing this thing. You want to come over for dinner? Um, and through You'll be a good host. You'd be a good host. Yeah, I've stayed at your place many times in Boston, for example. Uh, not just because I needed a place, but because I wanted to spend more time with Phil. Um, I'd find excuses. If I'm organizing a trip, I'd invite them to come on the trip, and I'd make it super easy for them to say yes. Hmm. Um, just find as, as much excuses as possible to go spend time together because you are indeed the average of your five best friends. And so for me, one of those friends is books. Um, yes. But uh, you can fill the other ones with, with really wonderful people. Uh, and so the trick is you are not, no one is a factor of their environment because you can shape your environment. You are a factor of your environment, but you can still shape your environment and, uh, or your situation. And a good example is me with dyslexia. Now, one of my favorite books is a book called Shantaram, which is about a guy who a goes, to prison, goes to India, becomes a slum doctor in India. And he may, meets like the Indian gangs. And whenever I read that book, I'm like, man. Like those kids in the Indian gangs, that's me. If I didn't have books, I'd be running a gang in India. Like if I was born in a slum, no questions asked, right? <laughs> because I got the drive. Um, naturally, I'm oriented towards like leading as opposed to following. Um, but you remove the erudite portion of me. But I'm so lucky to have that um, and to have had the opportunity to develop that, that I get to match both skill sets. And so if I was that kid in the slum, I'd say... Um, there's a really great line from Hamilton. If you listen to the first song, um, he is born a penniless orphan in St. Croix to illegitimate birth. His dad leaves when he's young. His mom passes away when he's 12. He moves in with a cousin. The cousin commits suicide. And then he scrapes every penny he has and uses it to buy books. And he writes all the time. And he gets a scholarship sponsored to move to the United States by virtue of his writing alone. And he's just so much fire in his belly to make himself the person he sees himself becoming that he excels. Same thing is true of Arnold Schwarzenegger. He's born in like the middle of nowhere in Austria, post-World War I, post-World War II, the most defeatist possible environment you could be in. Didn't even have a refrigerator in his house growing up. And he's like, I will go to America. And people are like, like yeah, right, Arnold, sit down. I was like, no, seriously, I'm going to go to America. And they're like, yeah, right. And he's like, I will be the greatest bodybuilder that I ever lived. <laughs> And they're like, Arnold, chill. <laughs> no. And he gets drafted to the Austrian military. And he sneaks out at night and goes to bodybuilding competition. goes AWOL. Gets put in prison for sneaking out of the competitions uh, uh, of base. But he wins the competitions. And eventually he gets sponsored and gets global recognition. And he goes on TV and he says, you know, the reason I am so built built is because of the Austrian military training. And they're like, oh, okay, let's get out of prison. Put him in the kitchen so he can eat more and get bigger. And he made it happen because the desire was so big. And so if you're a person in that situation, which all of us are to different degrees, mm -hmm. um, find the people that are right to be your mentors, read a lot, and, and dream and write out your dreams. I love that. And I think that's why you and I resonated so much when we first met is we both look at books as our greatest mentors and I love giving back and it, you shared that several times. It's like, just be grateful, share that gratitude. So what's the coolest or most unique way you or someone you know has shown gratitude for someone? Any cool stories? Because one of the ones I think of is Kevin Hart. He once set a $10,000 bottle of champagne to a movie critic after he wrote a scathing review of one of his movies. And 
Kevin included a note that said something like, thanks for boosting ticket sales on the horrible movie. So a little different approach, but I love how he came up with a unique, funny way to share gratitude, if you will. Yeah, I mean, when I look at myself, um, I have always been a very, very, almost aggressively happy person. Um, and obviously there's dips and there's highs, but for the most part, uh, I'm pretty even. And it's mainly because I feel a lot, a lot of gratitude for everything in my life. So I'll, I'll share two stories with you. The first one is when I was applying to college, I was not familiar with the college system in the US and neither were my parents. And so I figured, you know, it's like a lottery. You got to buy a bunch of tickets um, and make the best application you can. So I applied to 26 schools, which is unusual. Most people applied to like six. And I ended up applying to Brown and it was like barely on my list. It was only on my list because it was an Ivy, but it wasn't on my radar. And I went to visit and everybody was happy and smiling and interesting and interested. And I got into so many fascinating conversation. I was like, this is the place for me. So I went there. And every night when I was walking back home from a party, if I was walking by myself, I'd lie down on the grass and I'd look at the stars and I'd talk to God. And most people, when they talk to God, they, um, they ask for things. I didn't feel I needed to ask for things. I just said thank you over and over and felt gratitude for everything that I had. Mm. Um, and I basically did this most days for four years. Um, and it made my experience incredible. And I still do that to this day. Um, and that feeling of gratitude kind of like persists everywhere for me. For example, if I'm having a conversation with you and we say something nice about our friend Taylor offer, I will never have a conversation and say something good about someone else or hurry up something good without pulling out my phone and texting them the nice thing that was said about them. It costs me nothing to share it with them, but it's yes. going to make their day and it's genuine and it's usually unique if it's a specific thing. Um, and so when I was graduating school, um, I wrote thank you notes to a bunch of the people who had the biggest impact on me. And I remember very vividly sitting down one day and being like, you know, there's one guy who's not on this list. I don't know him personally, but I need to write him a note. And his name is Don Katz, and he's the founder of Audible. So I sat down and wrote this long email to Don Katz, the founder of Audible, and I sent it. And the email basically starts, hey, you don't know me. I don't know you, but I just graduated college. And you changed my life. I would not have been able to do this without you. And then I just told him my story um, and how meaningful audiobooks were to me at the time. Beforehand, there was no Speechify. The only thing that you could listen to was a pre-recorded audiobook. And this was the company that made most pre-recorded audiobooks I listened to. Um, and so I got a response within 20 minutes, three paragraphs. Now, Audible is a billion-dollar company. Uh, from Don Katz saying, Dear Cliff, this is not the type of that makes my day uh, my months and my weeks. Thank you so much for this, this message. Uh, and he offered like a ton of additional help and support. We became friends afterwards, but it's just because I, I, I needed to write a letter of thank you. And, and I did. Uh, most people just don't think about doing that. They don't think about where the things that they use come from. Um, but I do that all the time. It doesn't matter who the person is. If I feel a good vibe from someone or something, so, like I will walk around and be like, wow, yoga pants are amazing. My mom really loves the yoga pants. Uh, my girlfriend loves yoga pants. I'm really glad they existed. Who made yoga pants? Okay, search. Chip Wilson, cool. Read his biography. Yes, biography Lou Lemon. Go find, go He's find his, yeah, Lou Lemon. Go find his email address, message him. Chip Wilson and I are supposed to go walk the grind in Vancouver when uh, Corona is over. Um, it doesn't matter what, if it's a cool product or something awesome, I, I, I figure out who it's by and show gratitude at the end. Perfect. And uh, my men's retreat event is in Vancouver this year. So hopefully uh, we'll cross paths when we're both in Vancouver. I love that. The, uh, I love that. And one of the things that you mentioned, which was as soon as you think about that person or you share something positive or a thought comes to mind, I always hone in on making sure I text that person. Hey, I was thinking about you. Just receiving a text like that feels so good. And you don't have to go out of your way and create a whole long email all the time. You could just say, hey, I'm thinking about you. And it feels good when you're on someone's mind. And it's so simple and fast. So I'm curious to transition here. What's something scrappy you did to hustle that you couldn't have maybe revealed when you were first starting out, but you could reveal it now? And I'll give you an example. Reddit faked their first hundred users and named them after furniture and video game characters to get Paul Graham PG to invest in them. Sarah Blakely paid her friends in seven cities to purchase her Spanx product 
the clothing to make it look like she was getting sales at Neiman and Marcus in those seven cities. And lastly, the founders of Airbnb, really cool hustle, uh, made Obama O cereal and Captain McCain cereal when the election was going on to raise eventually $25,000 to help fund their startup. So what's something scrappy that Cliff has done? Yeah. Uh, Steve, who's one of the co-founders of Reddit and I, had a long conversation about them doing that um, like a year ago. Um, but man, my entire life is doing scrappy things. Like, <laughs> every day there's something new. Um, but I'll tell you about like really the beginning of Speechify, which was I didn't know what I wanted to do, what I wanted to work on. And I built all these different things in an attempt to figure out how I felt working on different types of products and they were in different areas. And I ended up uh, having a FaceTime call with my friend Chris Barber um, three times a week, every week for a couple of months. And I would just brainstorm ideas and I'd come up with an idea and I'd build it and I'd test it. Um, and when I, we came up with the idea for Speechify, I was like, okay, how do I validate this? And so what I did is I picked five Facebook groups and five Reddit groups. And I said, okay, I need to post on these groups a link to my product in the next week by uh, Thursday at 8 p.m., I remember. And my consequence was if I didn't do this, I had to run 10 miles the next day. And I texted that I had made this decision to my friends Chris and Simmer and Max and Valentin. So my reputation was on the hook. And obviously, I wasn't going to build a fully fleshed out product in that time frame. Um, and so what I did is I made a Final Cut Pro video faking that Speedify worked. Um, you click a button and it reads. And most of it was like my face <laughs> talking. But the demo was just like movie magic. And I was like, let's see if people would be willing to pay for this. So I made that video. It was like a two-minute video. I made a little website. And you can go in with Stripe and purchase it for like 100 bucks, um, Or pre-order. Pre-order the product. And I was like, hey, I built this thing. Um, it needs some final, final touches. Um, curious to see if you'd be willing to buy it. And I posted it on the Facebook groups. And a bunch of people bought it. And I was like, this is amazing. People are willing to pay for the product. Because my hypothesis was I would love to build a really good screen reader, but I don't think anybody would pay for one. And I had cash proof that people would. Um, and the way that I did it is I made a video that made it look like it worked. And um, I was explicit that it was not something you're going to get immediately. It's going to take like several months for you to get it. Um, and all those people were very, very happy when I sent them the first uh, pieces of software. This uh, is a great learning lesson for anyone that if you are thinking about starting a business, the common, I would say, societal norm or stereotype is build it and they will come. But most successful entrepreneurs first see if they'll come and then you build it. So you're not wasting all this time, energy and money building this product that no one even wants yet. First validate that people want it and are willing to pay for it and then build it. And so I love that you did that. And I think so many people can learn from that tip of advice. And that yeah, hustle. I would say even take it a step further. Don't see if they will come. Literally build a pipeline of your users before you build your product. <laughs> exactly. And then build your product. First time founders are product focused. Second time founders are user acquisition focused. So if you're going to make a tool for people with dyslexia and you don't know how to code, and that's the thing that's hard for you, but you can write, make the world's number one dyslexia email newsletter. Recruit 100,000 people to this newsletter and then release your app. Yes, um, build a following that first. Yeah. That way when you are ready to share some great advice or a product or a service, you already have the following in the audience to share it with. And okay. you have people to test the product with on a regular basis too. Exactly. All right, we are gonna transition into the under 30 seconds round. This is where I'll fire off some questions and just answer them. The first thing that comes to mind as soon as you can. Yeah. First one, what is the book you've gifted more often than any other book and why? The Four Hour Workweek by Tim Ferriss. So I read that book when I was 18 years old. I remember seeing it on a shelf in Barnes Noble. Um, what I would do is I would go to the bookstore and I would look at all the book titles and I'd go home and download all of them online um, as audiobooks. And it was like this big orange book. And, um, it has so many very wise lessons about the 80-20 rule, how to be efficient. Um, I've learned so many tricks from that book. And when you read it, the first chapter, Tim Ferriss sounds like a, a jerk. So take it with a giant grain of salt. <laughs> but, and Tim Ferriss is not a jerk. He's like one of the most incredible people in the world. Um, but um, yeah, 
so many good things about the lens with the rest of you, the world. Four hour work week by Tim Ferriss. I love that one. What's one of the best and one of the worst investments you've ever made and why? Worst investment is when I started Speedify, uh, after we started kind of like generating, generating revenue, like growing faster, I hired a senior engineer from Snapchat, a senior engineer from Apple, because I thought that now we were like a real startup. It's like, um, at the same time, there were some people who joined our company who worked for me in hackathons and were my students and were like messaging me on Facebook or Instagram or YouTube to try and work on this product. And it turned out that those, 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 those initial employees were uh, more experienced. They left the opposite six. Well, other people left the opposite 11. Um, and it took, I don't know, a couple of months for the people less experienced to become way better engineers, mm -hmm. but had much more high loyalty and much more high uh, drive and passion for the product. Um, and it was an important lesson to hire those people early because I learned that that's not the DNA that I want. Uh, but that was a wrong, uh, an investment that didn't pan out. Before I did it, it was a reasonable thing to do. Best investment is investing in those people who, uh, <laughs> like Simon, who I had joined my company when they were not experienced, did not even know how to code in the languages that we needed, but they had the drive and the motivation. And I would mm -hmm. give them little tests and I'd go to sleep and I'd wake up in the morning and it was done. And they spend the majority of the time learning how to do the things that I asked them how to do, but they really crushed it. Um, and they have stayed that way the entire time we've worked together. And so... Uh, the other great investment is spending my time teaching other people how to do things just because I want to, uh, because that indeed build a wide network of people who are grateful for things that I did in mm -hmm. the past. I might even never have met them, but the first opportunity they have to work with me, they, they, they look to do that. And it ingrains it more in your head every time you teach others. So what's one of your guilty pleasures or favorite cheat meals? Mm. Um, to be honest with you, I don't have any guilty pleasures. I only have good pleasures. Uh, my <laughs> thing is a Vega protein powder um, shake, and you eat it with uh, blackberries and blueberries frozen, and you put the powder in and you mix it up with water. And oh my God, it's like the nectar. Of the that coffee. seems like a healthy meal, Cliff. <laughs> no, I told you, I don't have cheap meals. I <laughs> eat that every morning and every night. Um, I mean, I love chocolate cake. I'm going to have that too, but as long as it fits in my macros, I will eat as much chocolate what? cake as I want. What's your uh, favorite chocolate cake company? Do you have a preference? No, uh, homemade. Any really, you know, it's weird. Vegan chocolate cake I find to be delicious. Um, have you ever had like zucchini bread? It's like is made out of zucchini rather than typical flour and stuff. It's delicious. And you'd be surprised, will, like zucchini I, I really brownies. Have, but I will have to check it out regardless. You heard it first. And uh, last two, pretend you won the Peter Thiel Fellowship and you were going to get money to start a business instead of going to college. Where would you start? In building that business? Yes. Well, at this point, winning the Peter Thiel Fellowship, you already have to have a really big business to, to win it. But <laughs> let's assume I haven't done anything and I'm a sponsor to build whatever business that I want. I do exactly the thing that I said before. Um, I would explore a bunch of different areas um, and I would validate demand and I would build demand um, on an email list, on a YouTube channel, on an Instagram account. And then I would invest time in, in finding really good people to, to work with. And I'd build minimum viable products only. Uh, I would never build fleshed out features, only minimum viable products. And I'd see if people use it. And if not, I'd scrap it and build the next thing uh, until I found people that people were uh, going to use, going to share, going to pay for. Uh, and then I'd expand and invest more in that. Great advice. And last one, what's something you never knew you needed? An example of this for me is the pop socket on my iPhone. My buddy Jake out of Boston, back when I, I'm in Tampa, Florida now, but when I was in Boston, my buddy Jake said, listen, just try it out for a week. If you don't like it, you just take it off. So I tried it out. I'm like, how did I ever use an iPhone without the pop socket I'll, now? I'll have to try to put that uh, reality pop socket on my phone. It's still in my backpack. Um, to be honest with you, Speechify, um, it didn't exist. And as I grow older, I needed it more. So eventually I just made it. So quick plug, go to the app store, search Speechify, download Speechify on your iPhone. I say another thing is called the ostrich pillow. It's not a neck pillow, but it's a pillow that goes around your eyes. And then hmm. you can just sleep against any wall, any surface. It can so it's better than I a like typical better. airplane pillow. Yeah, that's right. Although at this point I lost my ostrich pillow. So what I do is I take my jacket and I wrap it like that and I wrap one ostrich around my pillow. neck and I wrap one around my eyes and I'm set to go. I love it. 
Well, Cliff, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, before you go, what's, what's next for you? What's the next big goal or milestone or bucket list item you want to hit? Yeah. So it's fun because it's my birthday today. And, you know, we met uh, a little bit after it was my birthday as well. And that was actually one low point for me. And I decided to go on the reality trip because I, I needed to kind of reset in some way. And at the time, on the flights to Israel, I pulled up a Google Sheet and I wrote out like six categories, which were all my goals in the places in life that I cared about. Uh, love, speechify, fitness, music, um, adventures. And I wrote goals for all of them. And for the most part, I've, I've hit all of them since. So now I'm updating them. Um, but this year, it's mainly around the growing Speechify. And so we are now the, I think the third app in the news category of the App Store. Uh, we have an incredible team working with us. Um, and so, yeah, there's millions of people using it now. The goal is to get it to 10 million, tens of millions uh, in the next 18 months uh, and scale that really fast. Uh, we're doing a thing called Speechify Basecamp once uh, Corona is over, which is we all eat 3,500 calories a day and do super intense uh, weight workouts for, for 30 days. So I'm really stoked for that. Oh, that's uh, exciting. Yeah, my brother and I are spending a lot of time writing music here in quarantine. Um, and as always, reading more books. We'll have to make sure people go check out that uh, journey, adventure. Maybe you'll share it on YouTube or something so people can tune in and witness that journey. You will also have to uh, share some of your backflips. I know you probably don't have space to do it there. So maybe they could catch you on YouTube or your Instagram. So where do listeners go to connect with you? Yeah, easiest place to find me is on Instagram. Just search Cliff Weitzman, C-L-I-F-F-W-E-I-T-Z-M-A-N. Uh, or check me out on YouTube or Medium. Um, there's a couple of articles in Medium that are super useful. They're like my top productivity tools um, of the like the 2,000 books that I read. There's a list of like the, the 20 that were most impactful and most important. Um, and YouTube the same. There's a couple of like very powerful tutorial videos on how to uh, eliminate the recommendations on YouTube, for example, which saved me hundreds of hours of time. Um, so, and uh, Instagram is where you can find. I still use the fly cut app that hey, you, uh, you share with me and uh please go connect with cliff he's amazing uh, thank you ladies and gentlemen for being here today we learned so much about how to hack and hustle uh, how to read faster how to listen to audiobooks you now know where to go speechify app and hope this episode helped you as much as it helped me have an amazing day yeah and if this resonates with you just shoot me a message on instagram and facebook let me know cliff weitzman love it Thanks for joining us today. I hope this episode helped you as much as it helped me. Who do you think would benefit from hearing it? You can make an impact on their life by sharing it now. Before you go, I encourage you to tell us your favorite part of the episode in the review section. Now it's time to level up. Level up.